Welcome to the PDB Situation Report. I'm Mike Baker, your eyes and ears on the world stage. All right, let's get briefed. Today, we begin with the big story, the death of Yahya Sinwar, the Hamas leader who's believed to have orchestrated the brutal October 7th attacks. We'll speak with retired senior CIA operations officer and Middle East expert, Doug London, about what this means for the ongoing conflict. Later in the program, we'll look into reports that North Korean troops are now fighting alongside Russian forces in Ukraine. We'll speak with Carolina Hurd from the Institute for the Study of War to break it down. But first, our Situation Report Spotlight. After eluding Israel forces for more than a year, reportedly hiding in the expansive tunnel network underneath Gaza while surrounding himself with Israeli hostages to deter an IDF attack on his location, Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar, the mastermind of the October 7th attacks, was killed in southern Gaza. Now, in the immediate aftermath of the announcement, the IDF and the Israel security agency Shin Bet said Sinmar was discovered during a routine patrol by the IDF when soldiers stumbled upon three armed men. Reportedly, they exchanged fire and killed them. Israeli officials were quick to say that the discovery of Sinmar was coincidental and not based on intelligence, which, of course, is an interesting statement. For more on the death of Yahya Sinwar, as well as the overall situation in the region, I'm very pleased to be joined by an old colleague, former senior CIA operations officer and adjunct associate professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. That's quite a distinguished spot, by the way. Doug London. He's also the author of a terrific book. Go out and get this if you haven't already. It's called The Recruiter, Spying and the Lost Art of American Intelligence. I'm proud to introduce you to my friend and former colleague, Doug London. Doug, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's great to be with you, Mike, and with your audience. Thanks for having me. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I'm, and, you know, and we'll have a contest later on where the viewers try to guess where you are currently, uh, just based <laughs> on the clues that you're giving them. So, Hopefully there'll uh, be a good door prize Well, let's start. <laughs> let's, let's start with the... Uh, with the obvious uh, big news of the day, um, the termination of Yahya Sinwar. Uh, talk to me about how impactful is this? What does it mean for Israel, for Hamas going forward? I think it comes down most likely to the timing. You know, I think had Sinwar been killed a few weeks back, maybe a month or two back, I think it would have had more significance on Israeli politics in perhaps facilitating Netanyahu to think, okay, now I can accept the ceasefire because I can go to my country and I can say, we've gotten them all. We've gotten all the masterminds, all the leaders, you know, mission accomplished, what have you, and we can move forward with the ceasefire. I think where we stand right now, Netanyahu has the wind at his back. I don't think he feels the need to make any sort of accommodation and seems much more inclined to pursue his military uh, solution. Is, is this a situation where you think uh, Sinwar is taken out and it's... I mean, because I've heard already in this in this short period of time since the news broke, I've heard all sorts of opinions. I've heard some people say, well, this is it. They took out the head of the snake. Um, Hamas is in disarray uh, as far as being an efficient, effective terrorist operation or proxy for Iran. They're done. And then I've heard other people say, look, they got a bottomless well of potential, uh, you know, folks to to take up the, the headroom. Where do you stand on that? I mean, really, how how impactful do you think his departure is? You know, like all leadership decapitation that we've seen, particularly in our own war of terror, there is always a bench. I think the uh, results of the fighting is going to move Hamas regardless to a more asymmetrical plane, as opposed to fighting like a, a uniform, organized militia. That was bound to happen anyway. A lot of the senior leaders are gone, but, you know, Sinwa represented the military side. There's also still a political side. Khalid Mishal is still out there. Ali Baraka is still out there, but they're not really military types. So those who sort of studied at Sinwa's knee are still there. They're going to be younger. They're going to probably be more radical. They have less to lose. So I do not see them stopping their fight. But I see them transitioning by necessity to perhaps more of an insurgency or more of an asymmetrical approach. Okay, no, that's, that's actually very interesting. But do you think that there's a, there's a possibility here that as a result of this latest development, uh, there is a ceasefire and somehow Israel agrees to allow Hamas play a continuing governing role in Gaza. 
I see very little likelihood Israel would allow Hamas to play an official role, which has been one of the obstacles throughout the negotiations where Hamas wanted to still have a role. I think Israel does have much more flexibility now to go ahead and accept a ceasefire or maybe not push for all the more you know decisive conditions they wanted for an end of Hamas because they can. But I don't really see anyone within Hamas on the military side. And that's those people still in Gaza willing to make that accommodation. I think Khalid Michel, if he takes over the political duties, or Ali Baraka might. But these are guys who are outside and they're more they're in the pol polyfer on the political side. And they would have to still get the agreement of whoever is still running the show in Gaza itself. From an operational perspective, what do you make of, if anything, what do you make of the, the statements that uh, Israel came out with shortly after they confirmed his death that this had nothing to do with an intelligence operation, that they just, they just stumbled across these, these three individuals and one of them happened to be Sinmore? Well, it might very well be true. I mean, if you want to be conspiratorial, you could suggest that Israel is trying to minimize any credit they have to give to the United States for having provided intelligence because we've seen the president, we've seen the sex state very publicly, you know, confirm we are providing information on those who are mutually wanted. Because remember, Sinwa was also indicted by the FBI, along with Marwan Issa, Mohammed Deef, all those who were involved in plotting them. So the United States were after them as well. And the United States was very openly saying, yeah, we are providing intelligence because we have the authorities to go after these people ourselves. So if you want to be conspiratorial, you can think maybe the Israelis are graying it. I think it's just as likely they did stumble upon him sort of by accident. Okay. Uh, that's, that's, yeah, that, that's very interesting. Again, we live in a time, right, where everybody's got a theory and because they've got a phone, everybody's got a bit of a, of a, a, a loudspeaker. So there's been already uh, a variety of ideas out there. And, you know, I, I, as we always do, we encourage people to just <laughs> Take a deep breath, you know, and uh, we'll, we'll get details as they play out. Uh, but I think with, with what's happened at this stage of the game, uh, where do you see the Iranian regime? When we're talking about what Hamas is going to do, I don't know how you uh, disconnect that from what the Iranian regime wants Hamas to do. Uh, or maybe, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm wrong here. I'm happy to be wrong at times. I'm not really happy about it. But, but you know, how much of a role, how much leverage, how much influence, uh, decision-making do you uh, attribute to the Iranian regime and the IRGC as opposed to Hamas and their own personnel and leadership? Iran plays a significant facilitating role with Hamas in terms of providing materials, training, guidance, intelligence, and counterintelligence and such. But Hamas has always been a fairly bit more autonomous, more independent, then, for example, Hezbollah, which is really attached at the hip to the IRGC and, and, and Iranian intelligence. I think we've seen lots of public suggestions that the Iranians had some hint that Hamas was planning something big, were reluctant to get totally involved, were sort of noncommittal. And Hamas, likewise, was being a little bit uh, you know, limited in terms of what they were telling the Iranians, expecting they might have to go it themselves. So I believe the Iranians exert significant influence, but I think when it comes to Hamas and the Houthis in Yemen, they don't have full control or as full control as they do over the likes of Hezbollah. And I would think they even have more influence when it comes to the Iraqi Shia paramilitary groups uh, there that they fund, train and, and guide a lot more intimately than they do with Hamas. And you know, don't forget as well, and I know a lot of folks in your audience realize the Iranians are Shia. I mean, that's what they are. That's what the government is. And they're a Shia revolutionary regime. Hamas is Sunni. And in fact, it's an outshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a political, we could call it a radical group. We've seen it in Egypt behind a lot of those uh, riots, behind the killing of Anwar Sadat and such like that. So they are not totally tied together, not religiously as they are, but they're, they're good bedfellows, right? And they have mutual interests. Okay. For the, for the uh, benefit of our, our viewers, Doug, uh, talk a little bit about how much time. It's been a lot of time. How much time have you been uh, working and focused and, and dealing with the Middle East? Since the early 1980s, uh, when, when we came in together, 
that was my home and my my first baptism was on fire and i stayed largely tethered to that region for the next four decades and you know i've, I've worked these targets uh, you know targeted the hezbollah folks that uh, were ultimately eliminated by the israelis and those who preceded them i've you know cooperated and partnered with a lot of the the governments out there including the israelis and all the arab governments so you know, I know the folks out there and I, and I understand where they're coming from. And it's a different mindset than we might take here in the United States. And we've got to be cautious when we think about what's going on, not to apply our logic, because, you know, the cycle of violence is fueled by a whole lot of baggage and a whole lot of blood feuds and memories and scars that don't just go back decades. They go back centuries and beyond. And finding the, the most practical way out is going to be tough. And likewise, with the Iranians, they're sort of in their own way between a rock and a hard place that they're a revolutionary regime. They've got to stay revolutionary. And these uh, revolutionary groups and these uh, terrorist groups, they have to maintain their posture as resistance groups for credibility. So while it might seem logical for them to take some of the outs, it might be difficult for them from a face saving or political way to do so. Yeah, um, this is a, a, a simplistic question, probably, but that's that's my favorite kind. Uh, all that time, all that experience uh, dealing with this this region, has it made you um, more cynical? Has it made you somewhat optimistic that there is a solution for some? What do you want to call it? Midterm, long term peace or stability, um, or has it made you into a cynic in that regard? You know, I think the great thing about our profession, or I don't know if it's great or sometimes exhausting, you've got to be totally passionate and absolutely clinical all at the same time. So while you have your passion and your likes and dislikes and whatever, you can't be effective as a spy, as an intel officer, unless you're being detached enough from what you feel and your sentiments to kind of understand from an empathetic point of view, from the eyes of those who are living there, how do they see it? What are they going to be influenced by and what they're going to do? So, you know, I'm always hopeful. I think a good spy is always hopeful because we're always grinding, always trying to find that nugget, that additional nugget of information that's going to change our path, that's going to give us a new option, right? But at the same time, you've got to be resistant into being drawn into it and, and being too hopeful and being too optimistic and yet protect yourself from too much cynicism because you got to find some you know, golden means, as Aristotle said, to, to thread that middle. I, yeah, I give you credit. I, I think uh, my time in uh, beat the optimism out of me. <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I, I find that I find I tend to be a combination of pragmatism and, and cynicism, um, which is not necessarily a happy place, I don't think, at times, because I, <laughs> I admire I admire your ability to maintain some level of, of positivity and optimism in in this uh this region. I want to talk uh, when we come back. We've got some terrific sponsors. We're going to need to, to take a break here in a second. But when we come back, I want to talk about a couple of things. I want to talk about that, the, uh, the, the, the pager and uh, handheld radio operation that they engaged in. Uh, and I also want to talk about Doug's great book, The Recruiter, Spying in the Lost Art of American Intelligence. But uh, if, Doug, if you'll stay right there, we'll be right back. Hey, Mike Baker here. If you're tired of the same old coffee from those mega corporations, you know the ones I'm talking about, pushing their agendas, well, listen up. It's time to take a stand and support a brand that truly embodies American values. Now, of course, I'm talking about Blackout Coffee. They stand with hardworking Americans who believe in family, faith, and freedom. They roast some of the most incredible coffee that you'll ever taste using only premium grade beans roasted and shipped to you within, get this, 48 hours. Mm -hmm. For the cold brew fans, Blackout Coffee is now also excited to announce the launch of their two new ready to drink cold brew coffee latte options. Now don't settle for less. Make the switch to Blackout Coffee. Head over to blackoutcoffee.com slash PDB or use the code PDB for 20% off your first order. That's blackoutcoffee.com slash PDB, and the code is PDB. Join the movement and taste the difference. Remember, with every sip, you're supporting a brand that stands for America. And as we say around here, be awake, not woke.
Welcome back to the PDB Situation Report. Now, joining me once again is former senior CIA operations officer, good friend, former colleague, and author of a great book, uh, The Recruiter, Spying and the Lost Art of American Intelligence, Doug London. Doug, thanks for sticking with us, man. I really appreciate it. Happy now, I've here. read some... I've read some interesting, <laughs> you know what? And we've already had one whole segment, so, and you're still happy to be here. So that's, that's no, not the know. usual. <laughs> Usually I, yeah. <laughs> so. Well, showing the book kind of I'm very happy, happy you so stuck around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've, I've read some interesting things that you, you've, uh, you've written, um, in, in particular following the, the pager and, and handheld radio operation that took place um, with Hezbollah not that long ago. And, I wanted to get your take on it. I wanted to get your take on sort of the, the complexity of it all, the, uh, the abilities of uh, Mossad uh, and Israeli intelligence in general, uh, and also the utility of it. I mean, you know, I almost got the sense, um, you know, from one, in particular, one thing that you had written that you thought, okay, well, maybe, you know, why the timing now when there is, you know, still intel to be collected, there's still value in, in, in not pushing the button. Um, and advising Hezbollah just how deep that penetration was. So it's a, I know that's a wide playing field. There's a lot of questions there. I'm just going to hand it over to you and say go. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, no, first off, it's, uh, <laughs> it's an amazing success story in the ability of an intel service to identify the weaknesses in a supply chain, right? And Hezbollah has to get a lot of its technology, a lot of its material items outside the country, and it's sanctioned. It's a terrorist organization, as well as a political party. So it has to do things in that gray market. So for the Israelis to have succeeded, they first have to identify how uh, you know, Hezbollah is operating their own supply chains, just in general. And they're going to do it through their diaspora. The Lebanese business community around the world is uh, famous for being involved in all various sorts of import export business. And of course, among those are going to be Hezbollah operatives. So that is a good place for any service to start. I know we've started there as well. And the Israelis had to narrow down who the main points were in, in that supply chain. But then they had to figure out what you know Hezbollah was looking for precisely. And then they had to find a means to introduce those items through a cover, right? Through having some you know, backstop. And by backstop, I mean some mechanism where some person playing a representative, representing a company, whatever, had something behind him at least sufficient enough to withstand scrutiny. But Hezbollah, which has a great CI service, they really do, I can only go so far because they can't talk to other governments, they can't go on Interpol, right? So they have to do their due diligence a little bit as well on, on the gray side. And that's where the Israeli success was, was key in doing that. And whether they actually fabricated these devices themselves, because they're all knockoffs, right, of these pagers and, and walkie-talkies, or bought legitimately made ones or legitimately knockoffs, if you would, and modify them, I don't think that's clear. Mm -hmm. My commentary, uh, which, you know, maybe now we have a little bit more 2020 hindsight, was that you've gone through all this work, you've had that tremendous success of getting the supply chain. You've got basically walking, talking GPS locators. You can map out everyone in Hezbollah who has a pager, everywhere they go, and then what other pagers they're co-located with. And you start creating who's who. You add the walkie-talkies, which is going to give you audio. You're going to capture those conversations. And you could have probably even put more devices in the pages to make them into cell phones, if you would, and they could be transmitted. So my thought was that if they went through all this in a premeditated way, just to blow them up, you know, unless they were going to immediately follow with an offensive, may not have been as worthwhile. And I think we would have held on and, you know, like until like grim death until every last one was found because every device is still working and giving you intel. I, I think the Israelis planned it in steps, as I think we've seen it unfold, that it was all interconnected. This wasn't haphazard. They planned the devices to explode. They wanted to throw the operation into chaos. They had a lot of tracking data to go on. They had already patterns of life of the people they were going to hit thereafter. They already had their military offensive up north to follow through on. So I think now, as we kind of see it weeks later, okay, I still might have advocated doing it a little bit different because I like Intel, 
but at least it makes a, a bit more sense on how they approached it that way. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, there's still a lot of speculation over to uh, why the timing, um, but I, I, I agree with you. I mean, it's like having a, a well-placed source, right? It's a sort of the difference between the intel operations and a, a law enforcement operation where you're, you know, law enforcement operations, sometimes your sources are one and done. You know, you don't mind burning them. Uh, it's a, a very specific one-off task. Um, but in the intel world, you tend to look at, uh, hopefully, we're looking at the, the long-term value um, of, of any asset or any source or any operation. So it is, it is fascinating. Uh, this, is, this is one of those questions I think that people probably hate. That's why I'm going to throw it out at you. Uh, looking, let's give, it, uh, let's give it past the election. Let's give it past the inauguration. Let's go, say, six months from now. Do we have a ceasefire in Gaza? Um, and to what degree do, you know, does that influence then what happens up north with Hezbollah? Um, I guess this kind of ties into the earlier question about your optimism and, and how you view the region. But if you were a betting man and you had to put money on, on this, do you think we get a ceasefire in the, in the near future? Yeah, I'm not really optimistic. I think some of the statements coming out of the White House, uh, Jake Sullivan has been, there's sort of this renewed optimism suggesting, well, now that um, Tinwa is dead, Netanyahu can claim victory, we can, we can, you know, we can get our ceasefire. But I think we've crossed the Rubicon here where Netanyahu doesn't really see any constructive uh, road to a ceasefire. Why does he need it? I think having lived in known this area for a long, long time, I think they need another way out. I don't think they're going to destroy their threats. They're going to find themselves in a constant state of war for a very long time because they've eliminated any compromises, any sort of peaceful brokering of coexistence. But Netanyahu feels, and he's correct, he has the upper hand right now to continue striking militarily, to continue degrading, and he will. He's degrading Hezbollah. He's degrading Hamas. He's not destroying them. And we still haven't seen the other shoe fall when it comes to the Iran-Israel dynamic. Israel still plans retaliation. They've said, we've seen in the press, that they're not going to target the nuclear facilities. They're not going to target the oil, the energy facilities, as the United States has asked them not to. But where does that take us on the escalation ladder? If they strike, will Iran feel compelled to then escalate themselves and strike back? So I think, again, as I said earlier, a few weeks earlier, maybe a month or two, yeah, I think we'd be looking at a much better set of conditions for a ceasefire that would work for everybody. Hezbollah has already said, we won't stop shooting rockets until there's a ceasefire in Gaza. So they're kind of committed to that stance, right? Hamas has said, we're not going to accept a ceasefire until Israel agrees to withdraw militarily. Netanyahu doesn't feel he has to, even though his own military is kind of saying, yeah, but what's our tomorrow solution? Are we going to be here forever? So... I think there's less political pressure, though, on Netanyahu now as there were a few weeks ago. There is no protest anymore. They've all gone. I mean, how are they going to protest the man who's killing all their enemies, even though it might be setting it up for sort of these longer term consequences that are going to keep them fighting? And people on both sides of the border, from what we see from some of the press coverage, say, we just want a sense of normalcy back. And that's coming from Israelis and Lebanese alike. And, and the Palestinians are who in Gaza. But the people who are making the decisions are generally being served well, at least Israel and Netanyahu and whoever is leading the military fight in Gaza is being served by these circumstances. So in that regard, I'm not terribly optimistic. I don't rule it out. Uh, there's going to be a new president one way or another. That's going to impact the dynamics among all the place, all the players here, all the stakeholders. And, you know, for better or worse, it might it might give some of the players more reason to take a compromise while they can before they think, okay, this could maybe get worse if we don't take a deal while we can take one. Yeah. Uh, well, on that cheery note, uh, another question <laughs> would be if, if uh, I mean, th th there are some people who are saying, look, Israel is in a unique position right now uh, or in a unique moment uh, when it comes to the Iranian regime and that, and, and I'll be honest, I don't remember in, in my time uh, ever seeing quite so much daylight right, between Israel and the U.S. And I think 
in a, in a certain way, I think you could argue the Iranian regime and, you know, it's always been, oh, they're, they're looking for that. They want that daylight. They want to create, you know, friction and, and division between those two nations. But in, in a sense, it may not be <laughs> turning out the best thing for them if Netanyahu has made that decision that, look, I, you know, we, we're just in a moment here. This is a, a national security issue. We have to make the decision. So there are some people who argue that, look, this, now's the time. If you're going to go after the Iranian regime, if you're going to go after their nuclear facilities, if you're going to really make an impact, that could eventually, who knows? I mean, this is, this is talk about being optimistic, the idea of, of the Iranian population rising up and saying enough is enough. Uh, but to take that moment in time to strike at the regime in a very hard manner, uh, unlike what the White House has been pushing for, do you see any value utility in that? Well, the question is, what's the strategic aim here? What do we hope to achieve? Do we hope to achieve conducting operations of a sort that we think will force the Iranian people to rise up against the regime and that they would be successful? That would be, if you would, the most vile, most interesting strategic goal. We could do a whole lot of damage, but will we undermine the regime? My inclination is to believe we won't. I think you are spot on. I think Netanyahu thinks it's never going to get better than this. I'm never going to have the best opportunity. Iran's at its weakest. The United States is is constrained from putting pressure on me. It's a couple of weeks out from the election. What the hell are they going to do anyway? And I think on the Iranian side, again, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, they don't want daylight because they want the United States to exercise this influence because it's been American influence, I think, that has kept Israel from going after the nuclear sites over you know, misling them or whatever. But I think some of that's because it wouldn't end the program. I think we concluded from an intelligence point of view that the way it had been decentralized, buried, secured, we would damage it. We wouldn't stop it. And in fact, we might give them more reason to accelerate a weapons program. And in Iran, we've been hearing for God, you know, for over 40 years, our careers, right? And, and before then, that you know, any day now, those people are going to rise up any day now. You know, they're not because that's just they're not. It's not in their nature to take on a regime that has really beaten the hell out of them. And that's supported by the poor. Yeah. The progressives, the educated, the middle class, the people that we in the West might identify with. Yeah, they were in the green movement. They'll be out there rioting. They're the ones that are getting, you know, arrested and killed. But the the greater population of Iran, it's 90 million people, right, is the poor, and the poor it's actually benefited through the IRGC. And, and then, and, and not to like take your audience too much in the weeds, the, the, the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, they're not as homogeneous anymore either. They've got a lot of divisions of the old guard, the new guard. Um, so I think there's a lot of young Turks, so to speak, there, who are angling for blood, who are rattling their sabers and want to go after it. And you've got a leader in, in Ali Khamenei who's 85. He's had prostate surgery. He's had a bowel impediment. I mean, this guy's had all sorts of problems. His succession plan was wild when Raisi, the former president, was killed in a helicopter accident. And he's trying to figure out a legacy plan that the IRGC will buy into and sustain after he's gone. So, you know, they're not really anxious to go forward, but I think they're going to because they're going to be pushed and dragged into and they're not going to worry about their population. And I don't see us being able to get those people to really take it to the regime and be successful. Yeah, no, that's fascinating, Doug. Um, look, in the time that we've got left, uh, I, I wanted to pivot real quickly to talk about your book, The Recruiter, Spying and the Lost Art of American Intelligence. Um, tell me what drove you to write it? Why did you write it? And what do you want people to get out of it? Yeah, I, I wrote the book at the end of, you know, my long journey uh, that we all took. And I guess I had my own sort of issues I wanted to work out. But mostly it was, you know, my career was sort of equally folded over um, not, you know, the Cold War and post 9-11, about 17 plus years on either side. And the agency was extremely good at fine fix and finish throughout the war on terror. But it had started to lose a bit of its posture as an elite spy service. We were losing a bit of our edge when it came to the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians and the North Koreans. And we were, in some ways, I feared becoming an extension, another arm of the military. Really good at what we were doing, but maybe losing focus on the intelligence threats. 
that's really what drove me to write the book to try to, you know, say, here's what spying's really like to give the reader as best as the CIA would allow me, because this was reviewed and cleared after whatever number of redactions. This is what life is really like for a spy. This is what it's like for an agent. This is how the business goes. Everything from the, the work on the streets to trying to raise a family while living undercover and pretending to be something you're not, that your kids don't even know what's going on, but they're buying into it. There's a reason we do that. We make those sacrifices because we do some really impactful work. I were worried we were losing our edge to do so. I think we as a country have been forced to kind of get back into that. You talk strategic competition, right? Great power competition. It's kind of like more of a model of the Cold War where the difference was not killing people, but getting the secret so that we could prevent the Russians, the Chinese, and our other existential threats from posing a, a life-ending threat to us here. And I think we've seen some of that, that luster come back a bit since we've you know, been dealing with Russia over Ukraine, dealing with President Xi and China and his ambitions. You know, these days we declassify a lot of intel, but if we're declassifying intel, that means we're getting some secrets again. And we're getting secrets, obviously, through all the many um, capabilities we have, but also by people, spies who are in the Kremlin and in Beijing and elsewhere who are telling us what's going on, giving us context what's going on. So that's what drove me to write the book. I'd like to think the agency has come around to make some of those changes. And I'd like to think readers will get a real understanding of, you know, while you know you might certainly look more like the part of the spy and James Bourne and stuff like that, you know our work is being out of the spotlight and and living a life where we develop some super intimate relations and not intimate from physical but from a really deep, profound, soulful way with people to get them to partner with us, take those risks and tell secrets that make differences to Americans that they don't realize are going on. But this is what's going on when they go to sleep at night. It's excellent. The book, uh, again, is called The Recruiter, Spying and the Lost Art of American Intelligence. I encourage the tens of millions of rabid PDB Situation Report viewers to go out. I don't know if people go out to bookstores anymore, but wherever you get your books from, get a copy of this book. Uh, you won't regret it. Doug, uh, Doug London, former senior CIA operations officer, author, uh, Georgetown University professor, uh, man about town. Listen, thank you very much for, for joining us. And I hope when we call again, you'll come back again. My great pleasure, Mike. Super to see you. And I'm always at your disposal. Take care, man. I'll talk to you soon, hopefully. Well, all right. Coming up, what a great guy and a tremendous experience. Coming up after the break, new reports indicate North Korean troops, get this, could be joining forces on the front lines in Ukraine. Right? North Korean troops being sent by Putin's buddy Kim Jong-un, fighting side by side with Russian forces. We'll explore the impact on the conflict and Kiev's response with Carolina Hurt from the Institute for the Study of War. Stay with us. You know, every day, we hear more about surveillance and how our right to privacy is being infringed upon. And we hear about it because it's happening. It feels like, well, I don't know, it feels like we're living in a world where nothing is truly private anymore. Most of us, I mean, frankly, for the sake of convenience, we hand over our personal information without a second thought, signing up for services, shopping online, or, or using social media. But this convenience, well, it comes at a cost. Now, it's time for us to take a stand and fight back for our right to privacy. Now, one tool that's been essential for me in this fight is the all-in-one privacy app, and that's MySudo. It's spelled M-Y-S-U-D-O, MySudo. It's an app that lets you create multiple digital identities with separate phone numbers and emails so you can keep your personal information private. And in this age of constant surveillance, well, having MySudo is crucial. For my listeners, I've got a special deal. Go to mysudo.com slash Mike Baker and use the code, here it comes, Mike Baker. Hmm, did you see that coming? To get 30 days free on a Pseudo Pro yearly subscription. Take back your privacy with MySudo. Trust me, it's worth it. Welcome back to the PDB Situation Report. This week, we're getting more insight into North Korea's direct role in the war in Ukraine, with reports suggesting that Pyongyang may be sending troops to fight alongside Russian forces. Now, although the exact numbers are unclear, one Western diplomatic source claims that up to 10,000 North Korean soldiers 
could be heading to the front lines. In an address to Ukraine's parliament, President Zelensky warned lawmakers of an, quote, increasing alliance between Russia and regimes like North Korea. He emphasized that this is no longer just about weapons transfers. It's about North Korea sending its soldiers to join the invading military forces. Well, naturally, the Kremlin is denying these reports. Really? That's a surprise. Putin's press secretary, Dmitry Peskov, dismissed the claims, calling them a, quote, informational canard. Oh, well, look who's been listening to word of the day. Well done, Dmitry. For more on this, let me bring in the Russia deputy team lead and analyst at the Institute for the Study of War, Carolina Hurd. Carolina, thanks very much for joining us today on the Situation Report. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Oh, of course, of course. Listen, I, let's, let's, let's start with this. What do you make of this reporting that indicates uh, that up to 10,000 North Korean soldiers could well already be in Russia, right, receiving some training, only to be then deployed to the front lines in Ukraine. Do you think the intel there is credible? I, I think that it's important to situate this in a little bit of historical context because we actually started seeing the precursors of this back in the fall of 2023. We started seeing um, more intensified discussions between the North Koreans and the Russians, including a visit um, by Kim to Russia. Um, and then, of course, Putin visited North Korea this year. And we've seen kind of this intensification of rhetoric and diplomacy between the two sides. Of course, then the ammunition came. There's the reports of the ballistic missiles that are actually actively being used in Ukraine. And now the basically revelation that there are troops training in Russia. I do think that it is credible because the North Koreans have been very, very eager to learn from Russia militarily. We've seen exchanges between high-level military university officials and sort of knowledge transfer type of in, uh, exchanges. And all of that to say that I would not be surprised if troops start arriving at least in the front line in the border area of the Kursk Oblast incursion. I think that that is most likely where Putin is going to be deploying North Korean troops if he is deploying them. And this is an important part of the puzzle because Putin does not want to call a general mobilization. He does not want to risk the social upheaval of mobilizing Russian society. And he appears more willing to absorb and integrate foreign troops in order to free up manpower instead of using actual Russian mobilization. Um, so all of that to say, I think it's important to remember kind of how we got here when this started. And it is a continuation of the path that North Korea and Russia have been on since at least fall of 2023 and is very conducive to Putin's larger force generation calculus in a lot of ways. Of course, we can't confirm the numbers, but I think patterns and indicators are very much matching in this case. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating because... And there have been other recent um, tidbits and little pieces of reporting that have come out. They've talked about uh, six North Korean officers who reportedly were killed in a missile strike uh, that, that they identified. They're talking about now maybe upwards of almost uh, two dozen North Korean soldiers defecting. Uh, they were reportedly about four miles from the you know, Ukraine border. Uh, they were in the Kursk region and uh, took the opportunity to defect, which you know, tells me that those particular soldiers had some level of common sense. Uh, you've got the, the idea that, uh, that Kim Jong-un definitely would, would like to see his uh, troops get some real world battlefield experience. Um, and you've got, as you pointed out, you've got the manpower issues uh, that Putin's facing. So you put all that together and it, it lends credibility to this reporting that you've got a larger number of troops either in Russia getting training or about to be sent, uh, whatever it may be. Um, but, I mean, in, in, I suppose in reality, that you then have to ask, well, how impactful can that be? How, you know, how much of a, of a game changer is that um, if Kim Jong-un is willing to you know, do this bizarre gift exchange with his, his bro Putin? 
I think that's a fair question. And as with pretty much everything we've seen in this war, there is no one golden bullet solution, either for the Ukrainians or for the Russians, to completely turn the tide of the war. So if Putin is committing North Korean soldiers to the front line, that doesn't mean that they meet all of their operational objectives immediately. But my assessment would be that if Putin is going to commit North Korean soldiers anywhere, it would be to repel the ongoing incursion Kursk Oblast. And that would basically free up if they repel that incursion. And then also if they're using however many North Korean troops it is to free to repel that incursion, they freed up potentially tens of thousands of Russian troops to go back to Ukraine and continue pursuing the offensive operations that they have in Ukraine. So it's a little bit more of these trade-offs and these balances within Putin's force structure than really counting on a contingent of North Korean soldiers to quote-unquote win the war for Russia. That's never going to be the case. That also wasn't the case with the ammunition or the missiles. It's part of a larger arsenal that fits into the, the larger strategic calculus. Yeah, it's uh, again, I, I think uh, Putin, look, he doesn't he doesn't stay afloat. He doesn't survive. He doesn't he doesn't certainly doesn't win in Ukraine without the support that he's been getting from North Korea. And you could obviously Iran and, and China as well. They have kept his war machine moving forward. Uh, and and, and I, there's been very credible reporting uh, over the past couple of years about the, the degree to which North Korea has been providing munitions. But I think this 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 the idea of thousands of North Korean troops, uh, it's a bit of a shock to a lot of people who have just kind of been watching from a distance with what's happening. I, I, I don't think they, they imagined that that would be the next step that would, that would take place. But I, it is, again, it is logical when, as you pointed out, you consider the, the, the danger that Putin faces from enacting another conscription. Uh, for example, uh, and the last thing he can afford to do is is to upset the population. Not again. I, I've always been amazed, uh, Carolina, at the the ability of the Russian population to suffer, and I think the the West has oftentimes misunderstood that or or not uh, appreciated it enough. Um, so, but anyway, let's before I disappear down that rabbit hole. Uh, winter is fast approaching. There's there's a there's a brilliant statement on my part. Winter is fast approaching. You see, you don't get comments like this from every other podcast, Carolina. So, uh, with that being the case, what do you envision? Where do you think this this conflict goes over the course of the next few months? Yeah. So, as as you very succinctly pointed out, winter is coming in the, in the words of Game of Thrones, right? Um, but that actually does have battlefield impacts. Not winter in and out of itself but actually the fall and the fall rainy and muddy season, which in Ukraine is called Rasputitsya. And the muddy season is important because it really inhibits mechanized maneuver. And this expectation and the understanding of this fast approaching muddy season is actually already impacting what we're seeing on the battlefield because it appears as though the Russian command is currently trying to prioritize mechanized advances in lots of different areas of the front in order to basically push forward and make tactical gains, as many tactical gains as possible before the onset of this more challenging weather. Um, we've seen this in the Kursk Oblast area. We've seen this throughout Northern and Eastern Ukraine. This is very much a dynamic that is impacting the Russian operational calculus right now. So we've seen kind of an uptick in these mechanized assaults um, around specifically Pokrovsk. That's the big direction, though that has slowed down a little bit. But Pokrovsk and then the area south of Pokrovsk, referred to as the Hurakova direction, we're seeing a higher pace of attacks in this, this area as it appears the Russian command is really trying to push through, push tactical gains through before it becomes muddy and difficult for vehicles to move and transport infantry and basically support mechanized advance. Um, also, I guess the benefit of having observed this war for a few years now, this is kind of the dynamic we've seen that right before the muddy season hits, both in the fall and the spring, we see kind of this uptick in this push to get through 
to be able to really leverage mechanized advances while they still can. And that's very much defining Kharkiv Oblast, the Kursk effort, and the Donbass right now. Yeah, it's a bit of a, a the, sort of a war story as old as time, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's the weather impact on fighting, and it's, and it's always been an issue for, well, going back centuries, and t- ever since there's been war, frankly. Uh, yeah. Listen, Carolina Heard from the Institute for the Study of War. Don't go anywhere. Stay right where you are. We've got some terrific sponsors. We're going to need to take a quick break, uh, and then we'll be right back. Hey, it's time to protect your assets before it's too late, right? That's, that's pretty serious stuff. Now, look, recently, gold has hit all-time highs. Costco has seen double-digit growth in gold sales, double-digit. And Goldman Sachs, well, they raised their target to $2,900 an ounce just by early 2025. Even better, J.P. Morgan forecasts that silver will hit $36 an ounce in early 2025. And did you know that silver outperformed gold this year. It's up 32%, and that's an 11-year high. Look, the most contested election in history is coming up next month. Do I have to tell you that? I don't think I have to tell you that. So why wait to secure your future? Call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. Mention PDB, and you will always get best-in-class service from Patriots Protecting Patriots. Look, Patriot Gold Group has the No Fee for Life IRA, where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver. And you could be eligible for the No Fee for Life IRA on qualifying rollovers. Call 1-888-870-5457 for a free investor guide. And listen to this. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs' top-rated gold IRA dealer for seven years in a row. That is a lot of years in a row. So call 1-888-870-5457. Welcome back to the PDB Situation Report. Joining me once again is Russia Deputy Team Leader and Analyst at the Institute for the Study of War, Carolina Hurd. Carolina, thanks again for, for being with us today on the Situation Report. Uh, let's talk a bit about this, this push by President Zelensky uh, to get approval or authority, however you want to refer to it, from the White House in, in the U.S. to... Um, use long-range munitions to attack Russian military targets inside Russia. Where do you think that effort's going? Is he going to be successful? So I think the last time I was on this podcast, this is actually exactly the thing that we were talking about. And the fact that right. the American policy has not changed since I was last on the podcast, I think is quite telling. We've seen this dynamic, unfortunately, time and time again, where... The U.S., the West, but a lot, a lot of time, like the U.S. administration is kind of keeping Ukraine on a starvation diet in terms of changing policy in the way that Ukraine needs it to be changed. It seems as though this is a really, really firm line for the administration, despite Ukraine's pleas basically to have this capability and also the very wide range of research showing that this capability is very much needed for Ukraine's war effort. Ukraine's ability to inflict asymmetric costs on Russia by using these long-range systems to strike ammunition depots, air bases, stuff like that, it is incredibly important. We've seen how important it is, but it just seems to be something that the administration isn't budging on. And frankly, my answer to your question is that we haven't seen any change since I was last here talking to you about this a few months ago. Yeah, well... it's the circle of life. We just, uh, we're going to have you on every, every couple of months. We're going to talk. I'm going to ask you the same question. And we're going to realize eventually that Washington, D.C. exists on inertia and, uh, and, and, and not making uh, decisions. Uh, let me, if I could, give me your assessment of the effectiveness uh, of the Ukrainian military's efforts with the drone attacks uh, and other efforts to target uh, again, minus the ability to use U.S. munitions going inside Russia and attacking military targets, but their own efforts uh, to date now in trying to target Russian energy infrastructure and, and other facilities. Yeah, so it goes back to this. So so one of the, the components of Ukraine's theory of victory is this idea of asymmetric, generating asymmetric impacts. 
Ukraine has an equipment and a manpower deficit in comparison to Russia. So it has to basically get creative in inflicting costs on Russia with its inferior manpower equipment, et cetera. One of those ways is technolo technological innovation and drone warfare and these long range, very creative drone strikes into Russia is one part of that equation. And we've seen the costs of Russians losing, for example, fuel or lubricant depots that they need to supply their troops in frontline positions to keep their vehicles running. We've seen the cost of that. We've also seen the chaos that is inflicted when Ukraine strikes command nodes, for example, using drones uh, back in the Russian rear. So stuff like that is really important and it has almost immediate tactical to operational level impacts. When we're talking about ge generating more strategic level impacts, that's when those long range strikes come into play because unfortunately there's only so much you can do with a drone, an aircraft type, type drone that you've rigged to go strike an airfield a thousand miles from Ukraine. That's obviously important for Ukraine to be able to do. That's an important capability, but it's one small part of a larger arsenal of capabilities that Ukraine does need to basically level this up from tactical to operational impacts to strategic level impacts. Okay. Uh, this is probably a difficult question to answer and it's, and it's a bit of a soft science, I realize, but what's your perspective, what's your assessment on the current uh, mood of the population in Ukraine and the current mood or morale, whatever you wanna to refer to it as, of the population in Russia uh, when it comes to this ongoing conflict? So from what we can tell in both the Ukrainian and Russian cases, but for very different reasons, the mood has not necessarily changed. Um, Ukrainian sociological surveys are very much still putting high levels of public trust in Zelensky. They haven't really changed over the course of this year. I think that as a as however, so 18% of Ukrainian territory still remains under Russian occupation. That's a non-negotiable for the majority of Ukrainians. They understand that the lives of people suffering under occupation is a non-negotiable, not to mention the ideas of sovereignty, national identity, all of that. That isn't budging. And we've seen that consistently on the Ukrainian side. Of course, we're going into year three of this war. People are exhausted, but that exhaustion does not necessarily equate to complicity or despondence. I would not say that the majority of Ukrainians are kind of despondent or giving up. Um, at least from what I can tell from the surveys that I've been reading and that sort of thing. And also just from, you know, knowing Ukrainians and speaking to Ukrainians. The flip side of that is that Russian society remains largely apathetic. Putin has actually been quite skilled at siloing the impacts of the war in specific communities. So large portions of his constituency aren't really feeling the impacts of the war in a meaningful way. And that's kind of why we're not seeing these mass efforts of resistance in Russia, because the majority of the population can remain apathetic. They can go about their daily lives. They can go to work, feed their families, that sort of thing. And we've seen very much almost the same consistency on the Russian side of maybe not being pro or anti-war, but just as long as it's not impacting their day-to-day -day lives, it doesn't matter to them. I think that's probably the, the sentiment of the average person living in Moscow or St. Petersburg. Of course, there's certain communities that are bearing the brunt of the war much more disproportionately than others, but Putin has very much set up his governance structure in such a way that these communities don't really have the sway on the rest of Russian society in a way to make a meaningful difference. So in Ukraine, you see kind of commitment to the continuance of the cause, the continuance of the liberation of the Ukrainian people. And on the Russian side, you're still seeing mass social apathy, I'd say. So with that, if that's the case, if, if the Russian population in general terms, realizing it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a sweeping statement, is agnostic or apathetic. And if Putin is continuing to stay afloat, thanks to the largesse of uh, Xi Jinping in China and and uh, Kim Jong Un and and the Iranian regime. What 
what leads him to look for a, a, an off ramp? You know, where I mean, how I, I guess I'm looking for some logical end game here um, on either side, right? Because the the thought of this going on for another two or three or four years, uh, I think, is enormously depressing to <laughs> most of the international community. Not to mention costly in terms of lives and, and resources, but what you know, what would be the motivation, given what we're talking about, for Putin to say, ah, you know, let's let's put a bow on it and wrap this up? So that sort of rhetoric or thinking, we have not seen that from Putin yet. He has never once, in the years leading up to the war or during the prosecution of the war, signaled a change in, in his intent for Ukraine. His intent remains the complete conquest of Ukraine. That has never changed. Of course, that hasn't gone the way that he's wanted it to on the day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year basis, but that objective remains the same. And we see that rhetorical and ideological continuity in Putin's rhetoric himself, and then also the rhetoric of his enablers, his regime. The way that Russian forces are fighting in Ukraine proves that this is their, their basically theory of victory, right? The objective is the conquest of Ukraine. They believe that if they can basically keep, for lack of a better word, nibbling away at the front line, making these very small tactical gains, capturing rural settlements at a time, they can outlast the support for the Western support for Ukraine, maybe even outlast Ukraine support for the territories that Russia occupies and win that way. There is no off ramp for Russia. Russia's goal remains the same. Putin's goal remains the same. It is really a matter of whether the West continues to provide Ukraine with the actual material support it needs or if it basically shoehorns Ukraine into making negotiations. But Putin is not looking for an off ramp. He's looking for the conquest of Ukraine. And that has never changed. Never in, in his public addresses, in his private pre-war writings, it's all been very consistent. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, I mean, we have the luxury of being able to sit far away and say it's fascinating. Um, but when you, when you look at that and you think about what Putin's motivation is, and clearly he believes, it seems, that if he can just keep his population, you know, <laughs> apathetic or agnostic, uh, and he can maintain the support from his small cadre of, of uh, you know, uh, like-minded regimes, uh, members of the evil league of evil, then he can outlast the West. Because in part, the calculation would seem to be that the West is, is, is only willing to go so far, right? To, to, to keep Ukraine in the game, but, you know, not do what it takes to perhaps win. Now that leads me to this, this last question, which is, do you see a situation where Ukraine could win? Because there's been, seems like there's been a drumbeat here recently. I think it kind of came in the wake of the Kursk incursion uh, where they took some Russian territory. But uh, there were a number of pundits and, and you know, regional you know, observers talking about, you know, we just need to get over the line here, give Ukraine enough to win. Right. Where do you stand on that? Do you think that's a realistic view or is Ukraine looking at just getting to a point where they can get a negotiated settlement that's that's bearable? I think that Ukraine absolutely can win. And there are a few factors on which that is contingent. One of them, unfortunately, is Western support. Ukraine is doing a lot to build up its domestic defense industrial base do the force generation maneuvers basically that it needs to do to build out its domestic force. There's certain things that it is still reliant on on the West. So Ukraine can win, but it can't win without the West in this current state, right? The other thing that I think actually will enable Ukraine to win is the actual very real fact that Russia is not a bottomless pit of manpower and equipment as I think there's a very common pervasive mythos in the West suggesting that, you know, the, the myth of the Red Horde, the, the Red Army will never stop coming, or that Russia has a endless supply of tanks. That's actually not true. 
we've seen since October of last year, October 2023, Russia has lost the equivalent of five divisions worth of equipment in attacks in the Pokrovsk area, right? As they were trying to take Avdivka, as they were trying to advance past that. Five divisions of equipment as verified by open source analysts. That equipment cannot just regenerate out of thin air. Their, their defense industrial base is firing on all right. cylinders, but that runs out at some point. So Ukraine can win. Ukraine can win if the West provides it with the support it needs to get over this hump, at which point it basically is able to surmount the point of Russian, I guess, diminishing returns, if you, you think want to think about it that way. The point at which Russia actually cannot continue to support itself with weapons, equipment, and manpower as well. Um, also, Ukraine's ability to inflict strategic, um, very difficult strategic decisions on Russia also factors into that, is also part of the theory of victory, right? The attack into Kursk, Ukraine's ability to continue long-range strikes on Russian assets in the Russian rear, that's also part of what it will take for Ukraine to win. But yes, absolutely, Ukraine can win. Russia cannot keep doing this forever. And as long as Ukraine maintains the support that it needs, I really truly believe that it can get over this this hump into 2025, 2026. Okay. Now, well, and on that optimistic or somewhat optimistic note, um, I will say I hope that we're not having this conversation, uh, yeah, three years down the road. Right. So I, uh, I, I I hope that there is some opportunity for that to happen, but. Uh, again, I, I tend to be a bit of a, a cynical uh, individual. So, but when we call you back, I hope you'll come back. And I promise to not keep asking you, you know, when we're going to find that off ramp. Uh, Carolina Hurd, Russia deputy team lead, analyst at the Institute for the Study of War. Listen, thank you again. You picked up the phone. You said, hey, I'm willing to come back. I hope you'll do that the next time we call. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. And I'll, I'll absolutely be back next time you call me. <laughs> Outstanding. Take care. Thank you. All right. Well, listen, that's all the time we have for the PDB situation report. If you have any questions for me that you'd like me to address on the air, well, you know, reach out to me at pdb at the first tv.com. The mailroom at the PDB's global corporate headquarters is chock full of overstuffed mailbags dropped off courtesy of Carl the mailman containing your questions, your pithy comments, your suggestions. And look, here's what we do. Once a month, a select group of PDB executives Choose a batch of your questions, and we mash them into an episode that we call Ask Me Anything. So please, keep your cards and letters coming, as they say. To listen to the podcast of the show ad-free, well, become a premium member of the President's Daily Brief by visiting pdbpremium.com. It's very, very easy. And remember, you can find us at The First TV, our YouTube channel. Please check that out. It's at President's Daily Brief. And, of course, all the podcast platforms where you get your podcast stuff. And thank you again for being part of the PDB community. I'm Mike Baker. Until next time, you know the drill. Stay informed. Stay safe. Stay cool.